All right. So huge thank you for coming on, Serena. Please tell us about your mission. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So I was born in the children of God cult. I was given as a child bride at age three and suffered all kinds of horrific abuses. It's taken me all, probably a couple decades to actually heal from my past and be able to get to a point where I can talk about my story without bursting into tears. So I'm able now to find a lot of joy in life. I have a couple businesses on the side. One is where I'm a trauma recovery specialist. So I work with other child abuse and child trafficking survivors to heal from their past using all kinds of modalities connecting the mind, body, spirit. I also work part time at an equine therapy horse ranch. So I work with trauma recovery survivors and horses together. And I have a business on the side helping solo travelers get over their fear of traveling solo. And I help them plan exciting trips and give them tips and things that I've learned from my traveling all over the world. Okay, before we get into your story then, and we, we, you know, we commend you for all this work, this fantastic work that you're doing. Um, was there a gap in your life whereby you had to deal with your own trauma before you could help other people? Because I imagine to become, to get to a level where you're so strong now that you can help other people, because it would be very triggering and it would cause someone to relive things if they've been through these things. How, how, how do you do that? A lot of self-care. <laughs> so the main thing that I had to learn was I had to be selfish first and I had to take care of myself first. So when I help others and when I do a session, I, d I never do sessions back to back because I need that time to go outside. I need time to have a coffee, to read a book, to do something for myself before being able to put 100% into, into the next session and into talking about things with others because it is triggering. I have lived it. Um, I have experienced it. And sometimes things will just pop up into my head of memories of my own life when I'm talking to somebody else. So for me, it was very important to learn that being selfish and looking out for myself first is not something terrible like we were learned and like we were told in the cult. It's actually a form of self-care. So being able to recognize the times that I'm triggered and taking care of that right away before anything else was the most important thing for me. And it's necessary for survival. Okay, yeah. Serena. So uh, we've got a legal requirement on this channel then because of the nature of what we're about to talk about. I've got to ask you, do you waive your anonymity? Yes, I do. All right. So I don't know if you heard in the introduction, but there was an article in the sun out here. And the quote was, wearing a new pretty pink dress with my mother beaming at my side. I looked up at the 67-year-old man. As he slipped the ring on my finger, I was three years old, given as a child bride to David Berg, the leader of the cult, Children of God. Is that one of your earliest memories? One of my very earliest memories. Um, one of my very horrific earliest memories. So I was I blessed now, but maybe cursed, I would say, before with a very with an incredibly uh crystal clear memory from many different situations growing up. So apart from that, I have a lot of memories of being in Berg's household um, and the experiences that I witnessed and the experiences and events that happened to me as well. What was your very first memory? Um, probably earlier would be the drunken orgies um, in Berg's household. So all the adults would get together in the living room, they would all drink and have sex together and they would leave the children alone. And we would just be uh, sort of, they would think we were asleep at the time, but because there was music and loud noises, we would wake up and we'd just be wandering around the house by ourselves. And you would stumble upon these situations that a two-year-old who can barely walk or talk should never be privy to. So obviously these types of situations will really stick in your head and be quite triggering when they come up or if you see something like that in a movie or read in a book or some sort of thing that it, it smells sometimes can trigger it a, a specific song from the 80s or something so all kinds of things will bring those memories up okay and you, you were born into this cult i was born into the cult in david berg's household in the cult founders home so my mother's pregnancy was documented in a series of books called um, life with grandpa 
So I was actually known in the cult as a child celebrity, if you would say, if you would say before I was even born. So the entire series of Life with Grandpa was a way for Berg to explain to the leaders, this is how you raise a child. So he, he did that a bit with his own children, but not from even before they were born. So he started with my mother, even just simple things like we're going to baby proof the house and now she's going to do this and she's going to grow up like this. So my entire childhood, including the, my own birth in the hospital um, in the Philippines by my mother is all documented in cult publications. Which of your family members were the first to get into the cult and how did that happen? Um, my mother, it's an interesting story, but my father actually recruited my mother in Texas. So they, my father was the first and she met, she met, uh, she met him at University of Texas, um, on campus and she decided to join and soon after they left the U.S. and went, uh, to Europe. And then eventually she ended up in the Philippines with Berg. What was the process of recruitment then? Did they have a specific method? From what I heard from my mother's stories, it was mostly just singing and a lot of free love and happiness um, and joyfulness. Um, it, obviously, nobody get, wakes up and is like, today I'm going to join a cult, you know, so it it starts as a very sweet, free love thing, which is how the children of God started initially. Um, and it was actually a very pious group that people were supposed to go two by two. They were separated by men sleeping in one dorm, women sleeping in the other. But eventually, as Berg got more power, it sort of went down the dark side. But to in order to recruit a lot of hippies in the 60s, it was mainly just singing on the streets. It was passing out food because a lot of them um, were poor. A lot of them were living on the streets and it was giving hugs. Literally, they would give free hugs to people and food and that was the w main way that they were able to recruit so many people do you know how the cult started in the first place david berg did found the cult he actually started um, a singing group called teens for christ back in california with his own children and they were singing and witnessing and telling people about jesus and eventually it grew from there so they had a place in Huntington Beach where they would all gather and they would sing and read Bible verses. And then more and more people started coming. And then that's when David Berg realized that he could actually start an entire organization, which was based on Jesus, free love, joy, a lot of different good qualities that it started with. And um, eventually it grew. And obviously we know that it changed from there, but it was a, a lot of hippies and a lot of families and people looking to kind of break out of the system or the norms of society that they were thought that th they thought that they were forced to be in. And that's how it started. Do you know how long it had been going before your parents got involved? Oh, it was probably only two to four years. It was very, very early on, very early stages. And was it mainly centered in California? mostly in california then it went over to texas and it kind of grew from there okay all right let, let, let's go back to your story then so within the church then when your dad recruited your mom would she come in then and become his wife is that is that the structure or is it more open the structure um, the structure initially was not um, he, they would become wives. The, really, the structure and how they ended up together was because she wanted to go to Europe. But as a woman at that time in the cult, she couldn't travel alone. So she needed a partner. And the best way to find a partner who would travel would just to marry somebody in the cult. And since she knew my dad from the beginning, um, they just talked about it one night and decided to get married. And then they got married like a few days later and then they left to Europe. Do you know how old they were when they got married? I'm actually not sure, but it was in their mid twenties. Okay. And how old were they when they had you? My mother was 26. Okay. And then you, you, you know, you've got these wild, um, memories of activities that were happening that you witnessed as a young person was that normal to you then did it become you know that this is all you've been introduced to did it did you not 
you're too young, aren't you, to see that, that this is abnormal at that age? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I had nothing else to compare it to. That was really my own life. I didn't know anything else. But of course, there's a feeling inside your heart. Kids always know you have an innate feeling that something is off and something is wrong, but you don't know how to express that as a child. So what happens in a traumatic situation is that you just start withdrawing and then you think like, okay, I'm not enjoying what's happening to me. So something must be wrong with me. So then you start building a spiral of shame because you're not reciprocating what's happening to you and what's around you and everybody else is, but because you're not enjoying it, you either start withdrawing a lot or you start participating to, because you want to be part of the group. You want to be part of what's going on. So it can go one of two ways. But for me, I became an extremely withdrawn, extremely sensitive, extremely quiet child because I didn't want any attention and I didn't want people to recognize me. I just kind of wanted to blend into the background most of the time. And that was my way of trying to protect myself, which, of course, didn't work when you're a small child. But, you know, you, you try your best. You do whatever that you can. So did they cloister you guys or were you allowed to interact with outsiders such as school teachers, medical uh, doctors, nurses, things like that? Never. Um, I never interacted with anyone outside of our gates. Um, Berg did have private doctors in the Philippines that would come visit his compounds. So surprisingly, because he really preached against modern medicine, um, he would actually have dentists come to the house to check on him. So we would see dentists here and there. Um, there were doctors a couple times. I never saw one, but we did. That was the only contact with the outside world. I rarely went outside the gates. When I did, it was almost shocking to me because I didn't know how to react with so many things going on around me, what was happening, the people, and they were speaking a different language. I didn't know Tagalog. I was in the Philippines, but we all spoke English in the compounds, um, so I never learned the local language. And there were a few other children in Berg's household, and those were the children I interacted with. I never interacted with anybody else. Are you saying you were moved to the Philippines from California? I was born in the Philippines. Oh, okay. So when did that happen? When did they move to the Philippines, the cult? Um, the cult started Berg. Okay, let me um, back up. So when when um, when Berg started getting a bit more power and when more people started joining, that's when he started FFing in the cult, which is basically religious prostitution. FFing was for flirty fishing. So if he would send out women to clubs to entice men to go back to their hotel rooms and have sex in exchange for money. And that's how they supported the cult. And he would try to get these men to continuously give them money. So basically pimping out the women to give them money. So once he figured out he could pimp the women, then he realized he could pimp the children as well. So then he started using children as a way of singing on the streets or begging in the streets to get money. So in the U.S., there's there are laws about this. So it start when it started catching wind that there were these cults using children and women and prostituting themselves. Um, there were actually a couple warrants out and some searches to get him. So he left the U.S. and that's how he ended up in third world countries where the laws were more lax and people couldn't get him. And he started encouraging the cult to move out of the U.S. under all of these um, pretenses. He called America the whore and uh, the evil woman and Satan and stuff to get us all out um, of the U.S., and that's the way that he was able to continue leading and continue pushing the boundaries of what is okay and what is not okay. And basically, there were no boundaries um, once he left the U.S. And that's how he ended up outside of the U.S. And then the communes built outside of the U.S. from there. Do you know what Berg's childhood was like and what led him to this? He was in an extremely strict religious household. His mother, Virginia Brant Berg, was a famous evangelist, and she would preach a lot of sermons about God um, and a lot of very strict, very strict Christians. And um, he actually, he's very open about this in the publications. He actually documents and explains a time where his nannies and his babysitters were sexually molesting him. And he ended up putting it 
spinning it in a way saying that he enjoyed it when he was three, four, five. So if he enjoyed it, then all other kids should enjoy it. So that's how he encouraged child abuse and pedophilia inside of the cult, because these things actually happened to him. And instead of looking inside and trying to heal from it, he just repeated that trauma. And hence, now we have all this generational trauma going on in the cult where there's trauma and abuse that happened to him. And then he did it to his children. Those children did it to his children, to other children. So it's an entire generation of multiple generations of trauma because of Berg's extreme sexualized childhood and um, extreme organized religion from his mother. When he was in the Philippines in the beginning, were the U.S. authorities trying to get him for these things or was that later? That was later. Yeah, um, he he really wasn't being pursued that much in the Philippines. There were a couple times where authorities would come to the compound, knock on the wall, on the on the gate. We would open it, ask a few questions and then they would always leave. In third world countries, the thing is, it's very easy to be able to bribe officials with a bit of money and just tell them to go away. So that was a very easy tactic um, that he was able to do. And because of flirty fishing, he was able to pimp the women out as well. So if there were authorities coming to the house, he could just show him a nice, sexy woman barely wearing barely any clothes. And then now he would be able to pay off the authorities in multiple ways. Oh my goodness, this is mind blowing. What do you remember of the compound? The compounds that um, I lived in with Berg were extremely large. Uh, the irony is that the rest of the cult were living in extreme poverty, tiny houses, people sleeping in basements, sleeping in attics, begging on the street for food, and also tithing to Berg to these main houses and these main communes where I grew up in. But the communes that I grew up in with Berg in top leadership households my entire life, my mother was also a top leader in the cult later on. So um, in Brazil we and in the Philippines, we lived in practical mansions, tennis courts, multiple swimming pools, multiple houses on the property, huge lawns, parrots, floor to ceiling windows, koi fish ponds, parks that were already built in the house. So we lived in the lap of luxury. Now, because just because I wasn't wanting for anything did not mean there was still a lot of suffering. If anything, it was even more abuse and more evil and a lot of um, testing on children going on in his household to see what works, to see what he could do. Um, another terrible uh, memory that I have from about two or three years old is um, Berg started getting into doing um, pornographic uh, videos with children and having children doing strip teases. So without going into too much detail, this happened to me. And I ended up crying because I was so petrified and I was taken out of the video and punished um, and beaten and put in, in a dark room and saying, you're not going to eat, you know, you ruined the video and all of this stuff. But um, in my mind, I actually figured out that if I cried and if I looked ugly, I wouldn't have to be in the videos. So there were ways that as a child, I had to figure out survival of the fittest. How was I going to survive? How was I going to get through this? And I mean, if I had to get a beating over being in a video, a child pornography video, I would choose the beating. And that's how I, that's how I live my life. That's how I chose what I would be able to handle and what not. That's absolutely disgusting. Now, how old were you when he started to introduce you to these videos? Uh, three. As soon as I turned three, uh, everything changed. Mm -hmm. Was the reason why he chose the Philippines? I'm not sure. I know the Philippines in the 80s had were, are very lax laws as far as child abuse goes. I mean, even to this day, there's so much child trafficking um, and prostitution going on with children and child abuse. So the laws in the Philippines were very, very lax. And really he could get away with anything at that point. He had the money and the women to buy off the authorities and he had total control of the cult. Um, and everyone around would listen to him and people were scared of him. He was a scary man. He would scream and yell. He would have drunken four hour rants that you would all have that you, everyone would have to sit in the li li living room and listen to. He 
he had a literal throne in the compound. It was on a, it was a big chair on a raised platform and he would sit there and preach and, and scream at people and shame people publicly. And everyone would be quiet and listen because most people had by that time, you know, it was way too far to leave. It was, there was no going back for these members. They'd already been out and in the cult for many, many years. So hope you're enjoying this podcast. There's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. The other day I had to cancel free Amazon Prime memberships. I had a personal on the UK, Amazon, US, Amazon company account, US, Amazon, UK, Amazon. Do you understand how hard it is to cancel these bloody things? That's why Rocket Money makes these things so much easier, formerly known as Truebill. The app shows all your subscriptions in one place and cancels what you don't want for you. Rocket Money can even find subscriptions you didn't know you were paying for. Just like with me, with my four Amazon Prime memberships, you may find out you've been at least double charged for a subscription. To cancel a subscription, all you've got to do is press cancel and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Get rid of useless subscriptions with Rocket Money now. Go to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Seriously, it could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor, Rocket Money. Links in the description box. Cheers. It was just um, a way to fear them, to, get, to have the fear and control them by fear. And uh, doing a lot of pro prophecies. God said this. Jesus said that. If you don't do this, then then you're going to be shamed publicly. So he had a lot of control by fear from, from the members. How long were you in the Philippines for? I was in the Philippines for the first five years of my life. And then um, we left to Japan when I was five years old. And that was a whole other thing. Before Japan, then, is there anything that you remember from the Philippines you want to talk about? Um, I mean, there's there's so much. There's so much uh, memories from that time in Berg's household. Nothing, nothing good. But I will say that um, being able to live in those huge, beautiful houses and being able to go outside being able to learn how to swim at two or three, like these are the things that helped me survive. And these are the things that helped me get by just being out in nature. We had chickens, we had birds, we had fish. And because of that, I was able to connect a lot, on, a lot with nature, which helped me not be a complete mess. You know, like I, I, at that time, I just, I had no idea what was going on. That was the only life that I knew, but I am thankful that I was able to grow up and experience other things um, and be close to nature and learn how to swim because that did really help me shake off a lot of that trauma at a very early age. Good for you. Why did he move to Japan? Uh, we were sent there. Berg actually um, stayed in the Philippines for a bit and we were sent there. My mother was going to become a top leader. And as always, um, because... I was Mary Deer. I was called Mary Deer in the cult. There were a lot of the cult publications written about me. My mother was a top leader. Um, we were, we moved under cover of darkness all the time. Like the first time that we actually left during the day anywhere, I was like 15 years old. So I was constantly moved in the night. So we're woken up. Okay, you got to go. We take your take your stuff. And usually there's no stuff because they already packed a suitcase. And so I just grabbed my little stuffed animal and they said no you can't take it it's too big and they just threw us in a van and drove us to an airport and we actually ended up stopping at another commune in the middle of the night to say hi to some people and i had no idea who they were the commune was called the jumbo and then we ended up going on a plane and ended up in japan at the hcs which was called the heavenly city school and that was the largest compound um, at the time with 300 members so I went from a very small household of about at that for me, a small household of about 40, 40 people to 300. Um, so that was a, a crazy experience all on its own, because then I'm thrown in with a bunch of other people. I had no idea who these people were. I didn't even know what I was doing there. And we ended up in Japan. <laughs> in the middle of the night and just the next day it was like here's your class these are all the children you're going to be living with goodbye and and that was it and that's when i was separated from my parents 
Did you get special treatment because you were considered his wife? And how did he have like tons of wives? He had one main wife, Karen Zerby. Um, at that time, yes, uh, I did get special treatment pretty much uh, almost my entire life because of who I was. And it was mainly because I was Mary Dear from the life with grandpas and the publications. And my mother was Sarah Kelly. And she was a top leader in the cult and worked with Karen Zerby, who was his wife. So I wasn't considered when I left the household a wife anymore, more so than um, a, a child of a top leader or a, what, what is easy to describe now as basically a child celebrity. Um, I would sleep in a different area than the other kids. When authorities would come to the compounds, I was taken away, whether it was in a classroom or I was outside, people would immediately come for me, take me away, and we'd go hide in basements from the authorities um, when they would come. So I, we traveled under cover of darkness. I was uh, Two people, two adults were appointed to raise me, uh, Jeremy Spencer and another woman named Dora, who was also in the cult publications. So I had specific people in charge of raising me and a specific place for me to sleep, a specific time for me to eat. I was able to go see my mother um, and be pulled out of classes and take special trips with her. I wouldn't see her for weeks and weeks at a time in Japan. Um, and this, this type of treatment continued um, throughout my life and as, as well as when we moved to Brazil. So yes, uh, it was a bit of a cult inside a cult, um, as you would say. It was the hierarchy in the cult was very, very clear. And it was very obvious to me as a young child, especially as I started getting older in Brazil and seeing all of the other compounds and how they lived and how my life was, which was totally different. And that's when I started noticing the disparages and the different the different things that didn't that didn't make sense to me. And that's as I got older, I started putting things together and formulating a plan. Um, were you the youngest person he married? Yes. Okay. And then did you say you were in Japan for how many years? Two years only. Two years only. And is there anything that stands out in your memory about that period? Um, Japan was the place where they filmed all the videos, the cult publications and the propaganda. So they had a series called Kitty Vitties where they would sing songs about loving Jesus and being good. And children were made to be in these videos. Um, I was actually never in those videos because I was considered what they used as word in the cult called say law. When you're say law, that means you're like top of the top and you're not allowed to be in cult publications. You have to travel at night. You have to hide from authorities. So these were some of the main things that stood out um, to me. And, and I will mention that Berg did come to Japan um, and he did visit the, the HCS, the Heavenly City School, and he was staying at another compound called the dorm, and we were actually allowed to go see him. And the process to go see him was that we had to secretly go in this van, and there would be another aide of Berg's lying on the floor telling us to be quiet, like, shh, don't say anything, don't tell. So we were hiding things from the cult, the other cult members, and then we would drive to this secret house, Seaberg, there would be a whole like playtime snacks and things. Then we'd go back and we'd have to lie to the other children about where we were. Oh, we went to the park. We went to climb trees. We went to have a lunch or something. So at a very early age, I was taught to lie uh, about everything, about who I was, um, about where I was, who my mother was, what I was doing. So the complete, uh, I mean, mindfuckery, sorry for the, the expression, but um, that they would that the brainwashing of children started very 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 young, um, you know, five six years old, and this is this became my life on a regular basis, and then it became second nature to me. Before we go to Brazil, I've had a, a couple of questions come in about Karen Zerby and her son Richard, who apparently killed one of his abusers. Yes. Uh, what what happened to Karen and Richard then? Ricky Rodriguez is her her son. Um, he committed a murder suicide. There were two nannies that raised him. My mother, Sarah Kelly, and another woman named Angela Smith. Um, so Ricky actually was very instrumental in me leaving the cult and deciding to leave the cult because he left early on and he continued to emailing me email me while I was in Mexico saying you got to get out, you got to get out. So I actually saw him in California 
about a year before he committed the murder suicide. And he was asking, do you know where my mom is? Do you know where your mom is? And I said, I don't know where anyone is. Like at, at the time, I just wanted peace. I just wanted to focus on myself. Um, but he did manage to convince Angela Smith to come visit him because he was trying to get at his mother. Um, and apparently uh, he they met in an apartment and he stabbed her over 30 times and she died. And then he later shot himself in a car um, because of that situation. And he felt that he had failed because he didn't find his mother. Um, but this changed everything for, for, uh, for us as survivors and for the people in the cult. Like after that, um, nothing was the same, everything changed. Okay, how old were you when you went to Brazil? I was um, six and a half when I went to Brazil. And how long were you in Brazil for? We were in Brazil for eight, eight, eight and a half years. So actually a very long time considering my time in the Philippines and my time in Japan. And uh, I actually loved Brazil. I, I started to learn the language. Um, it was very intimidating to go there at first. Again, a whole new situation. You don't know anyone, but Brazil is beautiful. Um, and I was treated the same. At, at the time, I was actually told I couldn't tell anyone that I was Mary Dear. So that's when I became Serena. Berg named me Mary Dear, and he named me Serena. So Mary Dear was uh, the cult public name, and then Serena was my name that I would use uh, for day-to-day -day interaction with other cult members. So they just said, you, you, you have to say you lived in Japan, you were born in the Philippines, but don't say anything about Berg. It was a lot of fear. Like if you say something about Berg, you're gonna get a spanking. So in Brazil, I, I would sit in classrooms uh, and people would read stories about me. That's why this series was made, The Life with Grandpa. So the the children in the series was David and Tetchy, Berg's adopted children, Davida, my older sister, and me in these in these stories. Um, and they they were like the adventures of the four chosen children, um, if you if if you could say that. And um, I would have to sit there in class and read stories literally written about myself and read stories about my mother pregnant with me and taking care of me and just sit there like, oh, cool, what a nice story. So many times children would ask um, the teachers who would who would be teaching us, you know, we would be like 30 children in a, in a classroom in the cult. And they would ask like, oh, how old do you think Mary Dear is now? And one time I remember um, the the gentleman, the man, the cult member who was who was teaching us, he made the calculations and he goes, oh, she would be seven years old, just like you, Serena, the same age as you. And everyone's like, wow, Mary Dear is the same age as you. And I'm like, wow, yeah, amazing. And it's me. And I know it's me. And I'm sitting there just lying about my life the entire time. And this, this just, this went on forever until the point where I just I was so confused about who I was and my identity. Because as a child, if you say, okay, you're Mary, oh, now you're not, now you're Serena. Oh, but you can't say you're Mary, dear, because you'll be in trouble. So there was just it's so, so much crazy brainwashing going on um, as a child in these situations. It is frighteningly surreal, isn't it? Yeah. So, so was he still abusing you then through these years in Brazil? He was not in Brazil, so he left and started going to other countries. And by that time, I didn't know um, where Berg was. I was a child, so I stopped. I stopped understanding or even really having communication with him. But just because I left Berg's household did not mean the abuse stopped because Berg encouraged abuse. He literally wrote a handbook along with my mother, Sarah Kelly, called the the Davidito book, and it explains about you know why children basically the abuse the, the child abuse book like why children would enjoy child abuse i don't mm -hmm. want to get into too many details but really terrible stuff so the cult members started acting out on this with children all over the world you know at oh the time gosh. in the 90s we had about thirteen thousand members in the 90s so we're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of children that were abused and families had, I mean, families had five to 11 children. If you had more that it, or less than five children, you were a small family 
So these are a lot of kids being abused on a daily basis. I was abused mentally, spiritually, physically, emotionally, every single day of my life growing up to the point of just being woken up by a guitar um, or woken up by somebody yelling or woken up by a whistle at 7 a.m. and told all everyone to line up because we're being soldiers for Christ um, to sitting there for two hours of word time, which was cult propaganda time, brainwashing time for children, reading cult publications, to doing two hours of JJT time, Jesus job time, where we were scrubbing floors, uh, cleaning windows, taking toothbrushes and scrubbing light switches with toothbrushes, anything that they could for hard labor, we were doing, um, building walls, building fences. And then we did have one hour of free time, which was called get out time. And that was our time to go out and play and be children for one hour. But if we were too foolish or if we laughed too much, they would say, you know, the, the devil got us and then we would be punished and have spanking. So it was like a very fine line that we had to walk to actually be a child for one hour of our day before it all started all over again for the afternoons. And then by the time you were 10, you were either watching children, you were cooking meals for the communes, you were going out with other adults um, store to store trying to get money or witness to people and tell people about Jesus and get money from them. Um, or you were punished and you were just sitting at home getting spanking. So there was there were very few opportunities to actually be a child in the cult. And that was kind of how we lived our life on a day to day basis. So as you became a teenager, then was it all still normalized to you or were there some red flags and cracks appearing on the surface? Definitely by the time I was 12, I was uh, seeing a lot of red flags. I was putting pieces together. Things were not making sense to me. I was incredibly unhappy, incredibly shy, but I did have the opportunity to travel to other communes, which was not very common for me in particular because I was so secluded all the time with the people who were put in charge to raise me. So I didn't have a lot of interaction outside of the commune that I was in. But as I got older and the laws began to relax, well, Berg did die in 1995. So when his wife, Karen Zerby, took over, she did change rules a little bit. I would argue that it actually got more extreme later on. But the way that she did it was very smart because she ended up creating this book called The Charter, which gave children and other teenagers rights that they didn't have before so they could vote for things in the house they were allowed to travel to other communes they could go they could watch movies from the outside world which we were never allowed to do so she kind of opened the door for a bit more freedoms before she kind of went straight to some other really really extreme religious practices later on but that was how I was able to travel to other places in Brazil. So I actually started taking buses by myself, six hour buses alone in Brazil from Rio to Sao Paulo, which is six hour, a six hour ride. And they just put me on a bus and be like, okay, uncle John is going to get you in Sao Paulo. And you, you just hope that you arrived alive to your next um, station. You know, I was, uh, I was assaulted on buses because I was a little, white girl on a bus um, full of all these other people that I didn't know. I, my stuff was stolen. Like it was really crazy to me that I could like that they would put, I was 12, 13, 14 years old going on buses alone um, to these other communes, but I wanted to, and I took those risks because I had to get out of that house. I had to leave the teachers. I had to leave the people who were raising me. And I, I also wanted to speak Portuguese. I was 12 years old. I had already been in Brazil for six years and I didn't speak a word of Portuguese because I was so secluded. So I knew that being able to leave and go beg on the streets in other houses, go talk to other Brazilian members who actually spoke the language of the country that I was living in, I would be able to learn Portuguese. And that's my that was the way that I was able to communicate and finally be able to interact with people from the outside world, learn to speak Portuguese and really learn the culture of Brazil, which is a beautiful culture. And once I started talking to people who were Brazilian and living living um, outside of the commune, I was like, wow, it's really not that bad. 
as people were saying, like they're not full of Satan and they're not full of the devil. They're actually really kind people. They're, they're really cool. So that's when things started to change for me. When I realized that what I was being told my whole life did not match up to what I was experiencing. So a lot of cognitive, cognitive dissonance going on. When we wake up in the morning, we get out of bed and we start our day with Koro Snacks. Koro is a healthy snacks brand focusing on bringing additive-free natural ingredients to their customers with fair prices in bulk packaging. They have everything from nut butters to free from baking ingredients to cooking essentials and of course the snacks. doesn't get healthier than this because all those other snacks have refined sugars, colors, preservatives, and additives. Koro's snacks have none of that. Oh, I can't wait. So I'm gonna go for the bio energy ball today. Ooh, neat. Salted pistachio. I've got a little uh, chocolate bar here, I think. Oh, the coconut chocolate bar. Mmm. Oh, that was mm. good. Wanna try it? Ooh. <laughs> so what makes Coro special in comparison to others? Coro avoids using sulfur, refined sugars, preservatives, colors, and other additives. For a 5% discount on Coro's products, use the code TRUECRIME with no space in between true and crime. The link to Coro's online shop is in the description box on YouTube. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. I can't believe Berg died and got away with all this then. That's horrendous. He did. Yeah. What, where was the money coming from after his death? Same thing from members, from us, um, begging on the streets. So, for example, um, at the time, in, as a teenager, I was begging on the streets um, in Brazil and in the in Mexico and the U.S. If you went all day, back in the day, you could make a couple hundred dollars, to up, up to $400 on a good day. And you would give 30% of that to the leadership household. And that's how Berg made his money. So... Um, when houses say if, if there's one person bringing in two, three to four hundred dollars a day, you multiply that by the 10 children you have of age that can go beg on the streets. And then you get all that money and you give 30 percent to the leadership. That's a lot of money that they're raking in from 13000 members all over the world. So we're talking like 250 homes in the U.S., 300 um homes in south america 400 homes in asia so it's a, it was a lot of people and a lot of members and members were happy to give and you had to if you didn't give that amount then they would actually stop sending you the cult publications and you would be put on a special status oh are you allowed to still be in the family or not or not at the time by by now in the 90s they had changed their name to the family from the children of god um and so yeah there was a there was a whole process in order to get money from the members and it worked it worked very well did zerby continue the policy of flirty fishing she didn't that stopped in the in the mid 80s so a lot of the they officially stop officially for law purposes for authority and pur purposes they officially stopped flirty fishing in the mid 80s and they officially stopped child marriages um, and pedophilia as well in the late 80s. Now, just because these things were mentioned, like we're not going to follow the Bible. So the whole idea of child marriage was that in the Bible, when you're 12 years old, you're an adult, so you should be able to um, be married uh, according to the Bible. So it was, it was Bible teachings, but just because they sent out a notice. We are no longer encouraging child marriage. We're upping the age. It was all very vague. There was no spe specific set of rules until later on in the 90s when the charter came out. And even then, like the abuse never happened. Once you open that door, there's no shutting it. You know, children have children's lives have been ruined. And I was severely molested by teenage boys who had who had that happen to them by adult women. So it just kept, it just went went down in the line of generational trauma. So once you're opening that door, there's no closing it. You can put all the notices and the nice words in it you want, but it was still going on in all the houses. 
We've only got about 10 minutes left, Serena. Can you give us the downfall of the cult and how you got out of it? Absolutely. The first time I decided I was going to leave the cult, I was 13 years old. My mother had given a speech in the house. She was a visiting leader and um, she was talking about Abraham and Isaac and how Abraham, this is a Bible story, put his son Isaac on the altar and as a sacrifice to God. So I asked my mom in front of 200 people, I said, okay, so does that mean if you, if God asked to kill me, as a sacrifice to him, you would do it. And she said, yes, if it was God's will, I would. Um, and so that that changed everything for me, knowing that I was not safe with my own mother. I was not safe in this house I was growing up in. I was not safe in the outside world. And I realized no one was coming to save me but myself. So I had to secretly steal money from when I was begging as a child. And I started saving money up to where I could actually leave the cult. But of course, um, by that time I was in Mexico and you have to be 18 to be free of your parents. So I stayed in a house saving money all the time on the side. And I finally, the second I turned 18, I was like, okay, I'm out, I'm leaving. And there's nothing that you can do about it. So I took a bus yet again by myself from Mexico city to the USA. I um, was able to stay with some friends who had already left the cult. And I started getting everything to even get my life together in the U.S. because I didn't exist in the in the U.S. in my own country. I had there were no records, so I had to get a bank account, learn how to drive, learn what credit cards were, learn how to rent an apartment, and do all of that. So that's a whole other story in itself. But um, I did manage to do it, and I managed to eventually, after a lot of years of freaking out because of the of the uh, culture shock that the US was compared to third world countries. I had never even been to the US till I was 18. Um, so just figuring that process out was a whole thing. But I did manage to put myself through school and I graduated um, at UT Austin, ironically, the college that my mother dropped out of. So I was the first person in my family to graduate with a degree. I have a degree in corporate communications and a minor in rhetoric and writing. And I started working slowly in different corporations. I've been in the IT industry on the side for many, many years. And then I began my healing journey from there. And then that's when I realized I was able to start helping others um, who had similar pasts and similar backgrounds and similar experiences, just to help show them that there is light on, these, on the other side of extreme, extreme darkness. And you'll be okay. It's a, it's a terrible, hard process to go through. But to me, it's totally worth it to be able to live your life in complete peace and happiness and joy. And it doesn't even matter what happened to you in the past. Like you can overcome it. Sometimes you just need a little bit of support and you just need a little bit of help along the way. Did the cult try and get you back? Um, no, but they, when I left, they said, if you leave, you'll never come back. And I was like, oh, promise. Okay. <laughs> like, I was, I was done. So they, they, they uh, tried to kick me out at the last minute, but I basically kicked myself out. So no. Yeah. As you met and spoke to people who had normal upbringings in comparison to what you had gone through, did we, was your brain kind of like trying to process all of that? It's still in my thirties, very hard for me to associate a, a normal upbringing with anything in my life. So when people in the US say, oh yeah, I went to this dance, I think I was in fourth grade. I'm like, I don't know what that means. You have to tell me how old you were because you know there are some things that I just don't understand about a normal childhood and that's okay. You know, I, I, I probably will never understand some of these things but it was shocking to me that when I started making friends and being around other people at hearing the lives and the parents and the experiences that they had. I mean, it, it's just, it was incredible for me to even understand that there was a whole other life besides what I had lived. So what's the status of Zerbi and the cult now? Was it dismantled? Unfortunately, it's not. It's an online church. I believe you can Google it. I think they are the Family International. Karen Zerbi even has a Facebook page with a fan page with members so i mean it's incredible that people i know some of my friends 
some from the cult uh, that I am in contact with, their parents still will tithe and their parents still will give money to the Family International as the online church. So it's only got a few thousand members. So it's very, very small. And most of the members are older. Um, and I, I, it's shocking to me that it's even that people are even still listening to this woman and her teachings and even more giving money to her. So I, yeah, I mean, that's not the case with me and my family, but I know that is with others. And it's, it's crazy that they're even allowed to be online and come across as this nice Christian online church with all the darkness and the evil that they've been meant that they've managed to spread for the past 40 years. Are you being targeted for speaking out about them? No, they, they won't come after us because we've got receipts. I still have the ring that Berg gave me. And so do other of his child brides. And I always knew I was going to tell my story. I have photos. I have records. I have everything. So if they want to come after me, we welcome it. We want them to come after us because they're not going to win. We're going to win. Would you like to see Zer be prosecuted? At this point in my life, it doesn't matter whether she's prosecuted or not. I've healed enough from my own trauma in my life that to see some 80 year old woman in jail is not going to give me peace. It's not going to make me sleep at night. What's going to make me sleep at night is knowing that me telling others about my story, people will be able to maybe spot a dangerous situation or a dangerous cult situation or when they're, where their children are being separated from others and following a very extreme religion or organization. So I hope people can be more aware of that in their own lives because it happens all the time. What is your parents' status with the cult now and what's their status or relationship with you now? My status with the cult? Yeah, I'm your parents' status. Oh, my parents. Oh, and they you have and you. Oh, my parents have not been in the cult since 2010. They were actually uh, targeted in Mexico by drug cartels. So they left. Um, so I've been very lucky that they have not been in the cult and they have not been tithing. Now, of course, my mother being a main abuser and a top leader in the cult, she does need to answer for a lot of the things that she uh, has done and the lives that she has ruined. I actually do not speak to her. I do not know where she is. And I don't want to know where she is. We don't really have a relationship. We never, she didn't raise me. So it's a very far, distanced relationship um, that I have with my parents because they, they, they just didn't raise me. So I, I, I don't have a close relationship and I never had. Do you view them as victims of the cult? Cause they were, what was it? The early twenties when they were indoctrinated. Yeah, I, it's, that's a very interesting question because I've gone a lot over that in my head. So it, initially I see them as my parents and I get mad, but then I also realized they were in their early twenties when this happened. My father was even younger and when they joined and it's very easy for people to get manipulated and to be brainwashed and to be accepted into part of a group. And then you have to do these things in order to feel accepted. Everyone wants to feel accepted. Um, but at the same time, you have to still have a moral compass. You know, I didn't know any other life except being in the cult. And I still knew that something was wrong. And I still knew that I needed to get out. And I still knew that I needed to build a different life. So they were victims up to a point, but they do have to take accountability for having children up in their, up until in their thirties and raising them in a terrible cult and allowing them and even inflicting these abuses on them. At that point, they stop becoming victims and they start becoming perpetrators. So it is very much a push and a pull, um, but it's it's both. They're both victims and they're both perpetrators. How long has it been since you saw your parents? Uh, probably three, four years. And if you, for example, were out somewhere and they, you just bumped into them, well, what would you say to them? Wow, that's a great question. Um, Honestly, I'm not a big uh, preacher person um, at this point in my life because I do believe in karma and I do understand how trauma works and I do understand how the mind and the brain and the body works. I would really just wish them well. At this point, I feel sorry for them and I feel sorry that they couldn't 
acknowledge the pain that they have caused me and that they can't even acknowledge the pain that they have caused the thousands of other children, my mother in particular. Um, so it's hard to have respect for someone like that, but at the same time, it is my mother and it is the woman who gave me life. So I have a specific amount of respect for her for, for giving me life and providing me this life. But also, um, I just don't really care. <laughs> You know, I'm just, I'm too focused on my own life and my own success and my own happiness. If I saw them, it would be jolting at first, but I would probably just say hi and bye and leave and continue so, you know, my life. I've got so many questions for you, but we've run out of time and we salute you for going through the darkness and coming out this radiant spiritual warrior Thank that you, you are now. And, you know, all the people who are watching this, I've been reading it and everyone's just, their hearts are just pouring out for you here. Can you just let the viewers know where they can find you and support you, please? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, Serena Kelly on Facebook and Sir Kelly, S-E-R-K-E-L-L-E-Y on Instagram and Twitter. Huge thank you for spending time with us. It's such an inspirational story and we wish you all the best with your mission, Serena. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. It was nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Thank you.